All right. Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. This is April the 15th, 2018. Uh, the most important thing you can learn in this podcast is that Pete Rollick is wearing his daughter's pink earphones. So for those of you listening, I wanted to make sure and get that in there. Um, everything else that we talk about is, is secondary. They're actually magenta, but... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, buddy. They don't look magenta. <laughs> yeah. Let me have my little, you know, beliefs. Okay. Okay. No, I'm not, no, no judgments here. They don't even make it to pews. What are you talking about? <laughs> Our guest today is W.H. Uh, Pugmire. Hey, Wellen, how are you? I'm well. How well, are you all doing? Great. Good. Thanks for being on today. My pleasure. We are going to do our usual little round of introductions, and then Pink Earphone Guy is going to start us off. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Young. Yes, I, uh, I'm Kelly Young. Um, yes. Executive yes. editor of Strange Eons Magazine. Uh, Matt. I am Matt Carpenter. I purvey the prizes often because I buy copies of books that I already have, and it's really stupid. Anyway. Yeah, our- because your wife wants you to declutter yeah well i wasn't even gonna, thanks for bringing that up it's like you know <laughs> sure make me, make me sure. feel in charge okay Good this help. is the latest version of a graphic novel depiction of the call of cthulhu okay so the art in this one um is pretty darn good uh the uh i'm just going to give you an example um of some of the faces and sure and uh, I think it's it's uh, very well done. Uh, it's David Shepard, so uh, he made a slight variation on the ending that isn't quite canon, but still very enjoyable. So the winner this week will get a copy of this graphic novel. It's it's a Hollywood it's a Hollywood ending, isn't it? Where one lives happily ever after. Not exactly, but it kind of like it. it it's um. Cthulhu meets Ulthar a little bit. Oh, no. Oh, okay. It was Pete? all a dream. What? Oh, Pete. Uh, yes. Pete, Pete Rollick. I'm Pete Rollick, so you don't have to be. Um, author, editor, general layabout. Uh, Rick? Rick Lay, writer. And Willem, for those who the one person maybe out there who doesn't know who you are. Can you maybe introduce yourself a little bit? Um, I'm Willem Pugmire. I live in Seattle, the land of S.T. Joshi. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been writing Lovecrafting fiction since the early 1970s. I began around 1972 when I was a Mormon missionary in Ireland, Northern Ireland. And um, I began writing, I, I began reading fiction because when I was a Mormon missionary, I was a, I was a total horror film nut. And my missionary authorities would not let me go to see hammer horror films. They thought it was sinful. So to, uh, to make up for that, I began to collect anthologies. I was corresponding with Robert Block at the time so i would find books that had a story by robert block and then they also had stories by august daryl brian lumley carl jacoby and that's how i that that was my entrance my entrance into uh reading weird fiction and i became totally hooked and um when i when i become enthusiastic about something i it's my natural habit is to do a fanzine about it. So I began doing a fanzine on Lovecraftian matters called Midnight Fantasies in the early 1970s. And um, and then I, uh, around, I guess the early or mid 1980s, I began ri- seriously writing weird fiction um, primarily Lovecraft in fiction. I, I find I, I want to be identified with Lovecraft and as a Lovecraftian, and that is my one real desire as a writer. Mm-hmm. And um, 
So that's what I've dedicated my my creative life to. And I think I've I think I'm there. I think I'm pretty identified as a Lovecraft these days. Oh, I'd say so. Are, yeah. are there any copies of that? This is the first I've heard personally about the fanzine. Are there? Do you still have copies of that? Um, no. It's been a it, long time. Yeah. It's, you know, that was the 1970s, and um, I think I, I only did like 100 copies of each issue, and I can't even remember how many issues there there were. And then. Well, it was only 45 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> So. <laughs> it's incredible to have grown so old. It's it's that's really surreal because I I'm not aware of it because I'm I'm still doing what I was doing back then. You know I'm I I do a little Appa zine for the Esoteric Order of Dag and Lovecraftian Appa, so I'm still doing fanzines and I'm still a big H.P. Lovecraft fanboy. It's just that I. I now I get to sell my stories instead of giving them away, although I would give them away if I still sometimes do give them away. So it's uh, well, glancing over at the comments on the live broadcast. Everyone is extremely happy to see you. No so good. you got a lot of fans. I'm really happy to be here. I love my fans. They're the reason I write. So thanks for reading my stuff. Yeah. So, pink earphone guy, do you want to? <laughs> I have a name. I'm sorry, I am not a number. You, what? I'm... What is it? Damn. It's escaping me every time I look at you. All right. So, well, um, how you? <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have established yourself as a Lovecraftian writer. There's no doubt about that. But you have a whole slew of other influences. Including most recently, I think, Os well, not recently, but I think it's coming to more forefront now, Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde is a primary influence, in indeed. Um, I mean, I I, <clears throat> I have, you know, I, I bought Oscar Wilde t-shirts, and then part of my punk rock ethic is to cut out the picture of the t-shirt and safety pin it to the back of one of my jackets. So I... I so I have Oscar Wilde punk rock jackets, which I wear with pride when I go to the grocery store. And, um, and he, um, Oscar, Oscar Wilde and Henry James and H.P. Lovecraft are the main influence of me wanting to write in a poetic, beautiful, beautiful prose style. I, um, I didn't want to be like, Brian Lumley or Dean Koontz and be identified with a modern style. I wanted to be archaic. And and that's primarily why I've stayed in the small press, because the small press gives me that freedom. I don't have to write for a commercial audience. I can write exactly what I want to write. And, um, and my stories will be read. I, I've been very lucky in that I've found a small core of publishers who will publish my books. Um, the main one now is Hippocampus Press. And and um, because Hippocampus is primarily identified with Lovecraft, they are the perfect press for me. So, so I'm very lucky as a writer. Well, Pete steps aside to torture his dog some more, so I'll let him resume when he comes back. Okay. I'm but here. Oh, you're here. <laughs> Damn it, he's back. What? No, you go ahead, Mike. I, I can. No, I just wanted to. He he mentioned Henry James, and I would just as an aside before you start back up, uh, Pete. I was wondering if you'd ever. I think I might have mentioned it to you once. There's a Dan Simmons book called The Fifth Heart, Willem, and uh, Henry James and Sherlock Holmes are characters in the book. I've I've not heard of it. Hmm. Yeah. The Fifth Heart by Dan Simmons. You might pick it up sometime okay. uh, and see what you think. It's also very interesting because, you know, there it, it, it kind of breaks the fourth wall a bit, and it does it in a very, very interesting way. So that's, that's really all I can say about it without ruining it. But 
you know. Okay. Can of course, Dan you... Simmons is the guy who who's the original writer of you know that that the terror is based on the TV show right now. Sorry, what were you going to say? Uh, I just want to ask Willem a question on the Henry James yeah. Wise. Besides uh, Turn of the Screw, and uh, I would imagine the Dolly Corner, uh, what other works of uh, James do you feel influence you? Um, my favorite stories are the Aspirin Papers. Um, I guess my favorite novel it's it's really hard to find to to say i i love like something really esoteric like the sacred fount which is not at all a popular novel by him but i i really love it because it's just very strange but i also love you know portrait of a lady and um wings of the dove um and but i think it, as a short story writer he is unexcelled and of course, his short stories tend to be very long, you know, novellas. And, and uh, but I, I love, I love his, his beautiful language, and um, his characters. Uh, it's, he he is he just he, he enchants me, and and anytime I I pick up something by Henry James, I am instantly transported into that world and it's a world i love to dwell in and since you mentioned oh, sorry, and since, since you mentioned hippocampus will plug your i think this is your last book from them i think that is the monstrous aftermath yes yes and they will be um publishing the newest book that's coming out which is uh uh, a novel that I've co-written with uh, David Barker called Witches of Dreamland. And it's a it's a novel that takes place almost entirely in H.P. Lovecraft's Dreamland. And it was great fun to write with David. You've written several novels with him, haven't you? No, or novellas? Um, well, let's see. I've written The Revenant of... Uh, Rebecca Pascal, and then we have a, a book of short stories in the Gulf of Dreams and other Lovecrafting tales. <clears throat> and um, but the Witches in Dreamland is is the first novel of length that we I can't remember how many words it is, but and um, David actually did most of the work because I, I kind of petered out near the end. So he, he had to write the last few, few chapters because I kind of like, uh, I, I was feeling uninspired for some reason. So the majority of the writing, and it's very good writing, is by David Barker. But uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it published to see what people think of it. And I've got a signed copy of the Revenant of Rebecca Pascal right here in my hands. Mm -hmm. And for those for e easy fans, it's it's introduced by Joe Pulver, right? And dedicated to Mike Davis. So thank you again. It sure. made my whole week when I found that out. So you you do a lot for us, us Lovecraftians. So <laughs> so it's it's uh it's just fitting that we dedicate books to you. Uh, Pete. Okay, so let's talk about your style of writing because it's 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 very different from what you sort of expect from a Lovecraftian writer, at least what the ones that have emerged since Lovecraft. You're very concerned with atmosphere and mood. Yes. And rather than um See, I don't if this is it, I don't read other Lovecraftian fiction. I read very little horror fiction. So I don't know what the trend, the modern trend is, and um, I don't, I don't think it would affect me in any way if I did, except maybe it would just bore me, and I'm thinking, gee, I'm glad I don't write like that. 
I it's I I like to be old fashioned. I like to be different. I, I it's part of the punk rock ethic, perhaps. But it's also a very natural voice for me. Is the and it, it might come because I, I I read so much of of you know the fiction from the yellow nineties, the decadent Findy cycle, Oscar Wilde type fiction and and that's just what appeals to me. Um, and I I don't I I don't think I could I could write in any other way. And and there's no reason why I I, I, I would have to. It's um I, I like writing for a very distinct audience and it might be a small audience, but they, they have been absolutely devoted and I adore them. So I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> no, it, it's definitely a, a, a unique and independent voice mm -hmm. uh, in the Lovecraftian field. Yes. Um, there yeah. have been people, there have, there, there have been people online that do discussions of just to trash the way I write because they they hate it so much, <laughs> and uh, in in a way that's kind of a compliment as well. So what the heck? Well, I mean, the purpose of fiction is to to engender response. Mm -hmm. If you have struck someone emotionally, whether that's good or bad, you've engendered that response. Right. Art art creates a response. Right. The only thing that annoys me is when people consider my style an affectation there is no affectation in my work it is absolutely genuine well i think if it, if those people who have been lucky enough to spend time with you mm -hmm. even see you on panels or at film festivals or whatnot will realize that this is the way you speak this is the way you act this is the way you are mm -hmm. and it comes through in your writing you're very concerned with mood and atmosphere and the subtleness of the weird. Yes. Many people go way overboard on bringing in this monstrous thing. But I can remember, I think, when Rebecca Pascal shows up, it's almost as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. It was in something that was inevitably going to happen. So the main character is like, oh, yeah, you're here. I, I, yeah, I know you're dead, but... You're back. Um, I, I like I like working with personalities and characterization, and unless you're very clever, you you, you can't convey that with a monster. You know, uh, unless you're very very clever. So, so most of my concentration will be on human characters, but they're 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 always slightly bent. And sinister, and hopefully unique. Well, I, I think that's one of the things that you've accomplished really well is that where Lovecraft would focus on the academic, you have focused on the, the artist, mm -hmm. um, particularly with any Sesquimalt Valley stories and Mount Seldna. Mm -hmm. um, these are interesting places full of interesting people and anybody who walks in you know is not going to have a good time right but it's going to be an interesting time mm -hmm. um, Sesquil Valley is mainly a community of artists and and usually the people that enter in that are not artistic are the ones who are utterly doomed so but there have been artists who, uh, I mean, everybody is pretty much doomed in Sesquil Valley, except for Simon Gregory Williams. So, <laughs> in, in many ways, I've seen people compare it to Dunwich, but in many ways for me, it reminds me more of Carl Jacoby's version of, of Kingsport from Chameleon Town. Oh, yeah. Um, this, this place that's mystical and magical and there's an undertone of the malevolent but as long as you know what you're doing you'll be okay well you know i 
I, I based Sesla Valley on North Bend, which is here, you know, here in Washington State. And it's, I, I spent two weeks of every summer visiting my cousins in North Bend and riding down the river on an inner tube and, you know, walking through the forest tr trails and things like that. And so when I decided to write Lovecraftian horror, I, I knew that I wanted to in invent my own special locality as Lovecraft did with Arkham and Dunwich and Infamous and Ramsey Campbell did and it just felt like a very Lovecraftian thing to do to invent your own Lovecraftian set place and so I I just thought I'll use North Bend and it'll and I I I invented the word Sesqua because I thought it sounded Native American. We have towns in Washington like Issaquah, Snoqualmie, so I wanted that qua sound. So I, so I said, okay, Sesqua, and uh, I thought I totally made it up, and then I I found out there was an actual place called Sesqua. I think it's in Ohio or somewhere. <laughs> then, yeah, it, it it has served me well. Could, could you tell us a bit, uh, now some people listening may not have uh, danced under the moonlight in Sesqua Valley, uh, but can you tell us about Simon, how this character came to be and uh, what's he's an avatar for and uh, anything about him? Because I find him interesting and fascinating. Simon was based on an old boyfriend who was an absolute asshole. And so he had to be, he had to be a real wanker. Um, and I wanted him to, to, um, reflect the, the bestiality, the, the beast nature that is evident in, in some of the denizens of Sesqua Valley who are not completely human. And I've never really defined exactly what their nature is composed of because I don't I don't like solid definitions. I like ambiguity. But there is just something very different about the way they look, the way they smell. Sesqua Valley has has a strange scent to it, strange fragrance. And that fragrance um, can be found oozing through the through pores of 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 the children of Sesqua Valley. And um, these are creatures that are never really born. They just, they're born of shadow. They, they exist in the shadow realm of Susquehanna Valley. Another very ambiguous region. And, um, and they, they enter mundane reality for a season. And then they return to the shadow after they've, in their little mischief. Uh, okay, so one of the things that often appears in the Susquehanna story, uh, Valley stories is a mist that is the cover mauve, kind of like mm -hmm. Pete's uh, headphones. Um, and uh, I was wondering, that, that always was striking to me, and then you described the scent of the air. Like, do you have a, if we're trying to catch uh, an experience, what sort of scent are we talking about is it like herbal or it, is it more like uh earthy or what it's 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 kind of it's kind of a sweet earthiness to it um there's a sweetness to it but for some for some people and in some of the localities it's a sweetness that becomes sickening it becomes nauseating but then there are also patches that are um, touched by the shadow of the Twin Peak Mountain. And those places are poisonous and they reek like a wound, a festering wound. And they are the wounded patches of soil in Sesquil Valley. And, and they're the places that are shunned even by everybody, um, native or outsider alike. Uh, before we get back to Pete, I've got a question from the live audience for you, Willem. Okay. Uh, Gardner Goldsmith 
says, I'm curious. Willem noted the older stylists versus writers who might for, write for contemporary audiences. Could he expand on his views regarding style versus brevity? Love learning from great stylists. Hmm. Um, style is, is a very touchy subject for me. Uh, I am, a lot of people say that with my style, I am trying to write like H.P. Lovecraft in the voice of H.P. Lovecraft. And I have never deliberately tried to write like H.P. Lovecraft. So it, it bewilders me sometimes when those comparisons are made. My style is, is a natural expression of what I consider my old soul. Um, and I, I, I feel like I would be more at home in the 1890s than in the present age. Um, but that's because I have a very romantic period of that age through the, you know, my, my de devouring the biographies of, of those writers who lived and worked in that era. Um, so style for me is, it, it has to be a very personal expression of something that is almost undefinable. It's, it's just an, an essence of personality, an essence of intellect, and an essence of artistry that is natural to, to that particular writer. And it is something that, that develops over time. It's not something that, that is instantly there, unless one is a, a genius like Poppy Z. Bright. Um, it's my style has taken quite a long time to evolve into what I f think of now as my distinct voice as a writer. Okay, now another thing that I find interesting about your writing is oftentimes you're not interested, at least, I, I'm sorry if I'm misstating, it's like it's not necessarily forward narrative thrust, it's not necessarily even the dialogue, it's the um, overall trying to write the other senses, trying to write the scent, write the picture, write the, the sound, and this must have been inspiring because what I've seen over the years collecting your books is that you have been blessed with an amazing number of wonderful artists who have given your books covers and taken your subjects and just run with them. Yes. Do you I, have any favorite art of that? Um, oh, gee, there are so many. Uh, I love the art of Jeffrey Thomas um, and... Um, there, I, I, I love seeing my work illustrated, and it's uh, for the for the new book that's coming out from Centipede Press. We have we have some really great illustrations by the artist Tom Brown, and and they're absolutely perfect. They're they're very simple. They're not elaborate, but they are exactly right for the book and they really capture the atmosphere of my work. I, I don't think I've ever had any artist of my work who disappointed me. Um, and yeah, they're, it, and they're in it, Revenant of Rebecca Pascal, it's, it's Erin Wells and she's got interior yeah. illustrations for you too. Yeah. They're just wonderful. Yeah, she's, she's great. Um, so I, I've, I've been very fortunate in that. And I can't draw to save my soul. It's, it, I've always wished I was you know, an illustrator. And so I really envy their talent and I really admire it. And to see my own, I like an artist can, can illustrate a scene from your, from your fiction 
in such a way that it reveals aspects of your fiction to you that you have never realized because they, they see things from their own personal perspective and and it's just it's 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 wonderful so Pete, Matt, you have some more questions? Yeah, or, I'm working there, yeah. talking, I'm speaking. So, Matt Stop brought it. up <laughs> Matt brought up the collecting, you know, and of of your books. And I will admit, I have a lot of Willem H. Pugmire's books on the shelves. There's a lot of. I'm amazed at how many books there are. And despite all the things that I have. There are some volumes, well, there are some stories that I'm sure that I've missed because you've not republished them in decades, it seems. There are some that will never be reprinted. Um, I, I, I wrote a story about worms. or No, a tooth. It was a, the tooth. And it was about a tooth. From a monster, and 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 somehow the, the the monster lost its tooth, but the tooth still sweated, and so the the kid who was the narrator put the tooth in the shirt his shirt pocket, and then his shirt pocket became suffused with with monster slime, and and just thinking about that, I go, how could I write something like that? But I was young and. I had to learn, you know. I had to learn to be subtle. There's nothing subtle about about a pocket full of monster slime. So, you know, <laughs> you live and you learn, honey. And you occasionally rewrite stories and retitle them. I'm, and... I'm addicted to rewriting. It's it's um, anytime there's I have a new collection coming out. I, it's just I can't help myself. I have to look over the stories and I go, oh, I could have done that so much better. Let's do a rewrite. And um, and some people get really annoyed that I do that. That you know, in some cases, there's five or six versions of one single story, and um, and my editors kind of go crazy thinking, oh, what what version do we use? And I always say, well, just use the newest one. That's the one. But but then the newest one isn't always the best I have been told. So so it's I like I've, George I've, Lucas I've, with I've, Star Wars. Yeah, I, I've tried to stop. <laughs> I've tried to stop doing that, and and um, so now I I I don't think there are many rewrites in the new book that's coming out from Centipede Press. I think it's um, basically just new. Is and it's not. It's not new fiction. It's it's you know, they're all reprints. I have I have a couple of new stories, but then St used one of them in one of his anthologies, and he actually may have used two of them in two of his anthologies. So then they were going to be the brand new, never before published stories, and then St decided to use them in his books. So now there's, the book is completely print, reprints, but that's all right. So you from um, Centipede, because this one here, the Tangled Muse is just beautiful. Yeah. It's, beautiful it'll, book. It'll be, um, it'll be very similar to the Tangled Muse. Um, same format. We, um, we, we chose the format, the, the, it's a it's a bigger than usual, taller and thinner, um, to eight books that were found in London during the eighteen nineties, and then we used an illustration by Audrey Beardsley, and Jared thought this illustration looked like me in drag, so he went to use that. So that's why we used that. Um, and um, but it's just Jared. Jared's books are just so magical in a way because they're so well made and lovely and awesome. Oh yeah, if you can yeah. if you can afford Centipede Press books, yeah. do that's, so. That's the same. If you can afford, 
yeah, okay. then do do buy them. <laughs> yeah. so. Now you say that because you know you're looking at a price tag probably around two hundred dollars. Yep. But on I, the I don't side, I don't know. I, don't know whether, I think he's charging one hundred and fifty dollars for the new book, but I'm not certain. I hope yeah. it's not, I hope it's nothing more than that, but it's that's not in my control. So you know, whatever. Oh, on the flip, well, okay. So I I talked to, uh, this uh, about the with I've had talked about this with uh, David Hartwell, the editor, and and um, he said that Centipede Press does not publish books. They publish artifacts, and these are gloriously beautiful books that almost instantly become collectibles mm -hmm. and on occasion become impossible to find once right. once they're sold out they're sold out yes and people yeah. hang on to them and so. you know for decades i guess for a decade since that that first tangled press uh, tangled news came out is it a decade already when did that come out Tangled News? 2010. Okay, so... Whoa. Eight, eight years. Wow. All right. I have, sir, I have watched for that book on the, on the second-hand market. And I think, I've, I think I've only seen one become available for around 500. Yeah. It, it's just insane. But they're worth it. They are beautifully bound, museum-quality collections of of your fiction anybody's fiction really yeah. and you know when i began writing i never i never expected to have a an actual book published and then to have such a beautiful book of your work published it just it's mind-blowing because you just and you go how can my fiction be worthy of such glorious treatment but I'm I'm glad that Jared. It's just you know Jared likes my work, so I I'm very lucky in that. And now he's going to do another one, and it's going to be equally equally gorgeous. So uh, a lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think your work is worth it. Um, yeah, and I think he's actually doing 300 copies. I think St and I signed like 320 signature sheets. So there will be so that's, that's more than usual. Yeah, usually it's around the two hundred. Yeah, I think Tangled Muse was one hundred and fifty. Yeah. No. So. Yeah, but I think it's sold out very quickly. They like, sell out quickly, and then they're impossible to find. So right. So let's make a bigger paint run. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're working on the. So. You're working on that. That's going to be out soon. Uh, you just finished up the novel with Dan Barker, who, right. you know, it's funny. He's he wrote one of my favorite Lovecraftian short stories, The Leering Surf, uh -huh. back in the I think it was back in the seventies, maybe the eighties. I'd have to go back and look. What else are you working on? At the moment, um, I'm trying to write. What am I trying? I'm not really working on too much. St. Joshi wants me to write a story that features H.P. Lovecraft as a character, and this is something I said I would never ever do. And I don't even know if I'm supposed to mention that book, so maybe I shouldn't talk about it. But too late now, haha. <laughs> Sorry, St. Um, <laughs> but you heard, I, you heard it here you know, first. I, I did. I swore that I would never write a story. With H.P. Lovecraft as a character, and and I'm still I'm still I have kind of an idea for it, but in a way, the, the idea is so crazy to me that I want to do something really outlandish, like you know, have have Lovecraft visit Sesquil Valley and get sucked into a void or something, and then and then the and then the H.P. Lovecraft that, that that we all know and love from his later life is not the real H.P. Lovecraft. He's, he's the Sesquil Valley H.P. Lovecraft. I don't know, but you, you get all these crazy ideas. But 
it, it may eventually turn out that I cannot write a story featuring H.P. Lovecraft. But there are some editors who just won't take no for an answer. So, so you do what you can. Um, now, I have a, uh, I'm interested in something, and I don't want to get too personal, but um, you came to the Necronomicon back in 2013. And uh, your presence there is actually a highlight. You had a, a picnic uh, in the burying ground. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, But about that time, you started to have some significant health issues, and you said you just couldn't travel anymore. Um, I was wondering if you were feeling better or you were thinking about revisiting that <laughs> or um, do you have to come to the film festival to see you? I, my health is stable, but it's not good. Um, and basically I, I just, I, 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 I've grown tired of going to conventions and film festivals and scenes. I've just burned out and I don't want to go. But that sounds almost brutal to not want to go to something so that's really so wonderful and magical. And and I used, I used to love going to Portland to the festival, and I just don't enjoy it anymore. And um, so I I use my poor health as an excuse, but it's 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 kind of phony because I could probably go. I, I have a hard time walking. I've got a bad left foot, and and there's always a lot of walking involved. It, I I just can't stay in one particular place because there's something happening in this building, and then you got to go to that building, and then there's the gathering over wherever, and 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 then you have to walk back to the the motel where you're staying. It, it just um. The last, so the last two times I attended the uh, festival, I just I was miserable with pain because from all the walking, and I thought I can't do this anymore, so I stopped. Um, but I'm not, I don't like crowds, and I hate being on panels, and uh, so it's. So, it, so we have lots of crowds, lots of panels, and lots of walking. You know, yeah. So it's not to love. <laughs> so, so you won't be seeing me at anymore. But that's okay. There just gives me more time to stay home and write books. Yeah, there you go. And and that is something to be said, Willem. I you know I get asked to go to do a lot of things, whether it's out of town or locally. You know, you know, like. If, Will you come and do this? Will you come play Call of Cthulhu? Will you run a Call of Cthulhu game? Like, I want to do it all. Yeah. But for every six hours on a Friday night that I spend playing a game, that's six hours that I'm not writing. Right. And, and you know, I, don't, I don't have to go to these festivals to get my Lovecraft social fix because S.T. Joshi lives in my hometown. And so if I need a HP Lovecraft social fix, I just go visit ST and and you can't get more more out of it than that. It's just, you know, even though he's trying to do less as a Lovecraftian editor, whatever, but but he can't help it. He just, you know, he's got HP Lovecraft on the mantelpiece. He's got HP Lovecraft in his heart. He can't help. But we, you know, you, you show up and you start immediately talking about whatever's going on in Lovecraft land. So, so that's my, you know, that's my, I have my own little personal convention right there. That's good. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that why you started getting into reading horror anthologies, but what was the transition there? You're reading these horror anthologies. What was the transition to Lovecraft? What initially drew you to Lovecraft specifically? Robert Block. Okay. <clears throat> Robert Block was, he became kind of a friend through correspondence. And I initially, I did a fanzine. I, I 
first began doing fan scenes about horror movies because I was a horror movie fanatic. And I wanted to, um, one of my favorite magazines was Famous Monsters of Filmland. And so for one of my fanzines, I wanted to do a dedication, a tribute section to Forey Ackerman. So I, I asked people, I was to, um, who knew, who knew Forey? And um, one of those people was Jay Brennan Shea. And so he reluctantly gave me um, Robert Block's address and someone else, I can't remember who. And um, so that that was how I initially started contacting Bob was, um, but so we, we just clicked. I mean, we didn't exchange a lot of letters, but they were always great letters. And, um, and he, he in a way influenced me to try my hand at fiction it was reading his stories while i was a mormon missionary in ireland um that got me interested in reading lovecraft as well i had not really paid much attention to lovecraft and and so um because i i i read somewhere that that block began writing under the influence and inspiration of H.P. Lovecraft. And so I thought, oh, okay, well, I love Robert Block, so I, I'll try H.P. Lovecraft. And, and uh, I became totally obsessed. And uh, and then when I got back to America, I began doing my Lovecraft fanzines. And, and then I started seriously trying to write fiction. And it never occurred to me to try to write much any other kind of fiction except Lovecraft inspired fiction. And um, because I write for the small press, I can do that. And I don't have to, I don't have to aim for any other audience. Um, so I, I write for Lovecraft fans and because they're my, they're my fellows and my, my friends and, um, and I, I think perhaps it limits um, the possible appeal of my work to other readers who are not into Lovecraft. I, I, I don't really know if, can you read my fiction and not be a Lovecraft fan and, and really understand it or get it? I don't know, so, but I don't care. I write for Lovecraftians and uh, they're the only audience I care about. Besides Block's short stories, I get the impression from reading your works that you were interested in his activities as a uh, adapter of television uh, uh, episodes for uh, Thriller and uh, Thriller um, was a, Thriller was a huge influence. Yes, you um, seem to have enjoyed the Grim Reaper. Yeah, the Grim Reaper, Pigeons from Hell. Um, the cheaters, uh, and you know, and and that was part of that was the block connection because Robert either wrote some of those teleplays or they were they were episodes based on his short stories, you know, like the weird tailor. What a wonder! It's so it was simplistic in a way, but it was just so touching and different. You, there was never anything like that ever ever again either it just and it was it was just a perfect embodiment of of robert block's wonderful story it was so it thriller had great atmosphere great photography superb acting i think really great writing but i'm a real thriller fanboy and there there have it, i i loaned my my thriller DVDs to ST Joshi, and he was not impressed at all. And so, you know, it's like, you know, I go, I couldn't understand. I go, how can you not love thriller? It's like weird tales on television, but he was not impressed at all. So, yeah, the weird tailor was particularly good. And, uh, Rick, you've brought that one up before. Yeah. And, uh, beside it, 
besides adapting that story from Weird Tales, which is a uh, borderline Cthulhu mythos story in its original form, it just it, in its original form it mentions Yadith uh, from uh, Through the Gates of the Silver Key, and has a unnamed book of black magic. But when Block adopted it, he made that uh, Ludwig Prinz right. mysteries of the worm. And it's the first when, when I saw that on television, I flipped out. Yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, if if you pay very close attention, in the little opening introduction to the episode, they use the incantation from Chandler from the Stars. Wow. I never noticed that. Wow. Yeah, listen to what George McCready says as the sorcerer. It took me a long while to catch that. Hmm. It was like on the fourth or fifth viewing. It's the Latin incantation, the the one Hmm. that got soda quai for sasagua and the magnum in our. Mm-hmm. Radium, however you say that. The, yeah, well, the great. You know, thriller really inspired me as a writer because I wanted to write stories that had that kind of atmosphere. Um, I just found the atmosphere so intoxicating. And uh, so I think, and I think that because of thriller is one of the reasons why I view my, my writing style as very visual. Because I, I, I see everything like I'm, and when I'm writing my fiction, it's like I'm, I'm remembering a dream or a vision or something, and I, I write what I see in my head, so it's very visual. One thing about Thriller that we should just point out to people who hadn't seen it, it's sort of a schizoid series in that it couldn't make up its mind whether to be. Uh, a horror or a uh, detective suspense show. Yeah. So you would all in a between uh, stories about ghosts and uh, black magic, and then all of a sudden you have something about smuggling in Algeria. Right. <laughs> you mentioned your style again a minute ago, Willem, and I just want to throw in the comment that you know, you mentioned earlier about people who think that you write like H.P. Lovecraft or, you know, at least a few people do. I don't see that at all. I mean, it's not even close. I mean, it's Lovecraftian fiction and it's beautiful Lovecraftian fiction, but it's definitely not as H.P.L. would have written it. No, I think what they see is that my style is a very literary style, um, but it's more influenced by, you know, the the literature of the decadent period of london's 1890s and um which was the 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 year that lovecraft was born so you know it predates his his writing by a long while and but but lovecraft saw himself primarily as a as an artist in writing fiction you come across this in his letters. He wasn't just writing for this, you know, to to make a buck. He, you know, it, it was he he wasn't like E. Hoffman Price, who was completely commercial oriented. He was he saw himself as an artist, and and he was obsessed with writing things that had substance and value and originality and and i think he 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 did this so well he was so determined that he he succeeded and that's one of the reasons why he is now so so widely published and read was because he did excel as an artist and he wrote fantastic wonderful fiction You've mentioned the small press, the independent press several times now, and that's that's your audience and that's who you write for. Um, do you have any thoughts um, on 
the small press as it is now and possibly where you see it going. A couple of small presses recently have folded and that's understandable and some have gone on hiatus because mm -hmm. it's 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 so hard to run a small press. But you know, there's still plenty left. So I, I, I have this sad idea that people aren't buying books anymore and that it's increasingly difficult to sell books. Um, that that the ebook has now completely taken over, and I used to be very anti ebook. the The very idea of it was, you know, I, I would not consider myself published if it was just an e an electric edition. Um, to be published is to be published on paper with ink, and on pages that are bound. In, in hardcover or paperback, and that's what it means to be published. And so the idea of the ebook uh, really revolted me at first. Now I I understand that there are people that will not read my work in any other format. And and first and foremost, as a writer, I, I want my work to be read by people who who can appreciate it or be entertained by it. So I've, I've come around to the idea of, of, of electric books and, and uh, non-published outlets. I'm still kind of like, I'm still kind of hesitant about it, but yeah, I mean, I, I prefer, I prefer to have a book published as a book. So that so that I can I can get copies in the mail and I can hold it and I can show it to friends. It's a physical object instead of just an electric format that that people can pay for and then it gets zapped into their computers. I, I have to say I mostly agree with you and just looking around my my room here that I'm relegated to. Um, <laughs> I. I love the printed word on the page and the visceral yeah. sensation of opening a book, admiring the art. Even the cover is bigger. You can pick it up and you can look at it and you can sit back and just, I, I love that whole sensation. But when I'm at work, I might have 20 minutes to read while I'm at lunch. Mm -hmm. and then I have a Kindle app on my iPhone and it's a lot easier for me to just pull up a book on my Kindle and that mm -hmm. way I get a little bit of reading in at lunch. It's that was me just being practical, not because I prefer, I much prefer the printed page. Yeah. It, it's my, my older sister. Once she got her Kindle, she, she would never open the book again. And she would boast about, you know, I don't read books anymore. I just read my Kindle. Like it was some kind of accomplishment and, and I would get furious because, you know, I write books, damn it. I don't. <laughs> so, well, a couple, a couple things. First of all, as I've said a million times on this show, print and Kindle both have their pluses and their minuses. You know, a plus for Kindle is you go on a trip and you've got a thousand books in your Kindle. You're bringing a pretty big library with you. Right. On the other hand, I've got a lot of printed books and I love printed books. But the... The thing is, people these days, it's a choice. Let's say the latest Stephen King book comes out. They can choose to buy the printed version. They can choose to buy the Kindle version if they prefer. Or, you know, even a third choice, they can choose to uh, purchase the audiobook version. Right. So, you know, it's a preference. And as you said, as long as you're being read and, you know, paid for that work too. Right. I love audiobooks. Yeah, me I've too. Had, I've, I've had several of them put me to sleep at night. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so you know, no, I, I, I mean, really, they were bad or they were comforting? No, it, 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 it's like I become hypnotized by the voice. If I ever have problems with insomnia, all I do is like I put, a, I put on my audio book of Mormon and it puts me to sleep instantly. So, um, <laughs> you know. Mike, when you mentioned before, there's another choice. If it's Stephen King, you can get the book from the library. 
Yes, that's true. Very true. Um, I know I ask just about every writer this, and I think you've already partially or mostly answered it, Willem. But what does success as a writer mean to you personally? I have no concept of success. Um, because most people, when they think of success, it's it's based on on the number of books you can sell or you know the how much money you can make and for me for me the success my personal success comes from having the freedom to write exactly the kind of books i want to write and and i've done i'm i'm able to do this because i have succeeded in earning a reputation as 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 a writer who is reliable as far as producing a good Lovecraftian book, so to me that that is success is to have one a solid readership that enables me to write the kind of book I want to write, and I I you know I could never I could never try to figure to even want to try to figure out how to become more commercially successful. It has no interest for me. It's, um, I, I, I just, I don't need, I don't need that kind of money. And I don't, I, I think I would become so bored that it might ruin writing for me if I tried to do that. And I don't, I, I love writing too much to go there. So I, I, I write um, what I want to write, when I want to write it, and, uh, and that's it. Of writers working today, do you have some favorites that you want to mention? Writers these days? Yeah. My, my f personal favorite living writer is Thomas Ligotti, who unfortunately is no longer writing, but he's... He's the writer I, the modern writer I, I go to. Um, mostly um, for my own personal reading pleasure is I'll, I'll read books like uh, I, I love British murder mysteries. So you know Elizabeth George is a favorite, and mm -hmm. um, I, I I don't I'm. Mostly, what I read are um, literary studies of writers and British murder mysteries, and that's that's about it. And then, of course, the 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 religious books. I I, I love I love religious study, um, Bible commentary, stuff like that. It's um. Okay. I find the Bible a fascinating book. I, I believe in it. I'm a believing Christian, but I find it an absolutely strange book, and it inspires me to write strange fiction. Um, so it's that may be a sacrilegious way to approach the Bible, but I, I view it as both ways. It, it inspires me as as a writer of audacious scary fiction and it inspires me as a believing mormon who believes in in god and jesus christ and stuff like that do you read the king james version or do you have another preferred um, version in the mormon church we we um for, we have our version is the king james version mm -hmm. that's and the most that's pretty poetic version yeah, yeah. Yes, and when Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon, he he translated it in the lingo of the King James Version of the Bible. So when you're reading the Book of Mormon, it's a very King James esque. So it's uh, and it's you know that's that's the language from the time of Shakespeare and things like that. So it's it's a it's it's a language that I love. Guys, do we have any more questions for Willem? We've so, already asked him what's coming up. So, 
Well, I just want to know what is the very next book that you think will be published of yours? Um, I it's hard to I I can't predict when my books will coming out. The uh, the novel that I wrote with David um, Derek at Hippocampus says now it's, it's going to come out in summertime, so I suspect that might be, but. You know, it's. It, I, I'm hoping Jared publishes the hardcover this year, but he has so much going on, and and I've, I basically told him I don't care how long it takes for you to publish the book. Just I want I want the experience of publishing the book to be joyous for Jared. So I want him to do it when he can afford to do it, and when he has, you know, when he's when he's able to do it. So. Hopefully that will mean this year, but um, but the next book for sure will be the Witches in Dreamland novel with David Barker from Hippocampus Press. All right. Well, thanks, Willem, for being on the show. Really, yeah. really great talking with you. Well, thank you. Uh, you said you're going to stick around while we talk about other yeah. things for a few yeah. minutes? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Uh, I guess first thing up would be, I think, at least one of you, maybe several of you, have seen the Quiet Place. A Quiet Place. I haven't seen it yet. What, what did you think, Kelly? I absolutely loved it. Uh, it is not without faults. It's not a perfect film by any means, but I was on the edge of my seat and jumped a couple of times, which just does not happen with me. You scaredy cat. Yeah, yeah. I was also, you know, I, I showed up at the theater. I, I did it during the middle of the week and a late show, and I got there, and it was just an empty theater. And I thought, oh, thank God. And then about five minutes before the movie started, people started, you know, piling in. But there was really only about twenty people, and it captivated everybody. I mean, not a sound was made. Really? Yeah. That's not usually my experience in the theater. Nor mine. Uh, I'm waiting on. A quiet place till it hits video, and then I'm gonna watch it. Yeah, and I was talking to Philip, uh, you know, uh, Fricasi, who also loved it. I I would like to see it again, you know, immediately, but I'm sure that I will not be blessed with a similar experience. It just can't happen <laughs> twice. I remember I, going to movies in the uh, early in the 1800s. mid '80s in yeah, yeah, that's right in Philadelphia, and people talk about people talking in the movies now back then it was audience participation i swear to god it's like <laughs> i saw the clint eastwood movie tightrope and and people were saying like look behind you he's behind you or he's running through the graveyard there's lightning lightning's gonna get him get him lord <laughs> I, I don't think i have a problem with that it's kids on their cell phones yakking with each other about on other topics and lighten up the theater with their cell phones while they chat is what I have a problem with. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, unless they all start going the Alamo Draft House way, I don't think we're going to get away from that. In fact, it's in the previews for the film, or not the previews, but the, uh, you know, the 20 minute section that's all advertisements now, they were even promoting how you can use your phone to get points by pointing it at the screen right now and all of this stuff. So they're encouraging you to have your phone on. Yeah, I know I sound like an old man, but no, just no. no. I pay to watch the movie. Yeah, L L Lowe's theaters tell you to turn your cell phone off. Yeah, this one did say you know when the movie started um, to to be kind and turn your cell phones off, but the fact that they were promoting stuff you know right up until then to use your phone on it's just the way the world is now, I guess. Uh, Mike treated us to a movie last night on uh, movie yeah. called Marrowborn. Marrowborn. Oh, yeah, Lovecraft Cuisine movie night last night. Yeah. And uh, I think Willem would really like this because uh, after I saw the movie, uh, two, two names came into my mind Robert Block and Henry James. And I'm not going to explain why. I don't want to give away the plot of this movie. Yeah, it was a really good movie. Marrowbone, again, is the title. Where can uh, we find it? 
I rented it on Amazon. And still, it's about. I think it's on Netflix too. Is it's it? about five ninety nine. Brand new. I'm not sure. Um, I'll double check. It, it's about seven dollars, I think, on uh, Amazon. So it's marrow. How do you spell that? Marrow uh, bone, like bone. It's like bone marrow. Bone marrow. Root. Okay. Yeah, all, all, all one word, Willem. All one, one word. One word. It, it's a name of a family. Okay. On the one hand, it's seven dollars, but on the other hand, if I were to take my family to a movie, that's seven dollars a piece. Plus four hundred dollars for popcorn. Last night we went to the movies and we spent forty two dollars for four of us. And Amazon rentals usually aren't that expensive. I think it might still be in some theaters, and that's why it'll probably go down. Yeah, it. Uh, the movie is takes place in nineteen sixty nine. I forget which state it's in, but it is. Uh, Superbly written and directed. Well, I'm glad you guys like it. I was getting a bunch of different suggestions for movie night. Um, for those who don't know, every Saturday night at 10 o'clock Eastern, we do a movie night now. So if you're interested in that, just go to Rabbit, uh, which is uh, R-A-B-B dot I-T and sign up and add me. Uh, my ID is Mike Davis 222 all, all together. Anyway, and I'll invite you next time we do a, do a movie, which should be next Saturday night as usual. Anyway, so I thought, okay, I'm just take something completely different that nobody suggested that maybe nobody's even heard of. And it turned out great. It was a great movie. Everybody seemed to enjoy it. And it, I'm obviously not going to say a thing about the plot other than to say that, that it definitely surprised me where it went. So uh, I don't even want to compare it to any other movies because that might give some of it away. Right. It's nothing like the Goonies. <laughs> it's nothing like Ghostbusters either. So um, Kelly also, I had passed by and ignored a TV series. I don't know if it's on Hulu or Amazon or both. Maybe it might be on Hulu uh, called Counterpart with J.K. Simmons. Right. And yeah. you just told me something before the show that's going to make me go back and watch watch this now. Yeah, it's on Stars actually, and the first season just ended at the beginning of this month. So. I just heard about it from somebody who was asking me if I had watched it. And I was like, yeah, I'm not sure that's really in my wheelhouse. And they said, well, you obviously don't know what it's about then. And uh, this is not a spoiler, but maybe it'll bring more viewers to it because this happens in the first 10 minutes. Uh, J.K. Simmons is a kind of mid-level government worker in Berlin and finds out that the the agency he works for basically safeguards a a breach that leads to a parallel dimension. And uh, he didn't even know that's what they did. That's how low he is on the totem pole. And then he gets kind of sucked into it. And it feels very much like it's going to turn into a, um, a espionage type film with, with this weird sci-fi background. It was not heavy on the science part of it. Um, so it's, I don't even know if I would call it science fiction, at least the you first get, episode. Sucked I saw. In, uh, physically or metaphorically? Well, metaphorically, but I imagine he will be crossing over because, you know, he meets basically his other. Wow, and, okay. and, uh, and it seems clear to me that there's going to have to be some kind of, um, I'm going to take your place while this danger is happening or, or something like that. Um, I don't know. I was sucked in on this first episode, and I'm definitely going to watch the entire show. Okay. Well, I don't have stars, but I do know that shows like this you can just purchase on Amazon. Right. Um, so whether you have that stars would be or not. something like you would see straight out of Art Bell. Yeah, speaking right. of Art Bell. Right. Nice segue. I, 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 you know, I'm a writer. Yeah. You are? Well, you know, I've convinced my publisher of that. <laughs> Fooled everybody. Uh, well, how thing. weird is it that he died on Friday the 13th? Yes. Has anyone actually seen the body? <laughs> 
You were going to say something, Rick? Yeah, so we were talking about Legion last week. Yeah. They may be going Lovecraftian. The words Migo have popped up. Right. I saw an article about that. Sent it to Kelly. Now, Migo is the actual term in Tibet for a bottle of snowman. So uh, that arguably may not be Lovecraft, but I, I was stunned when I heard Migo. So, meanwhile, I have finished the first season of Legion. Aubrey Plaza is now my favorite actress in the entire planet. She's, she's pretty great in this. <laughs> I uh, So, I read the interview with her after she uh, auditioned for this part. And the producer and director are like, oh, yeah, we'll just rewrite this. We wrote this for a man. We'll just rewrite it for you. And she's like, no, I, I want you to leave the script exactly the way it is so that she could do what she did. I, I, I have to applaud her, her fortitude and her acting chops because I have only ever seen her in things like Dirty Grandpa and – a, a few class. other and classics let, like that. Yeah. yeah. Let's give credit to her dancing and singing. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. This She's is incredible. This is actually quite impressive. Um, she nailed that role. Um, I have a new hairstyle goal. And uh, <laughs> um, again, yeah, well, I, when she pops up with that hair that looks like she. You know, it's Tim Burton hair. It's beautiful. I I, I want to have that hair. I want that hair. Um, we I want don't, you to have it. I yeah. You know, my was my wife was like, you almost have that hair. Two more weeks, it'll be there. And uh, you know, now I got a haircut. Um, but one of the things that I mentioned on my Facebook page was that I thought that she did such a good job in that role. That she would make an awesome Asnith Wake. Absolutely. Um, she's got the she's got a slightly in's mouth look to her. Yeah. Um, she carried a male role. If you ever meet her role. in person, don't say that. Oh, line, okay. Hell, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually went to dinner with Pete when I was. You know, in, you, you look kind of in his mouth. <laughs> no, listen to me. I went to dinner with Pete when I was in Florida, and he sweet talked our waitress so much. It was like honey dripping out of Who, his Pete? mouth, and she was just, yeah, she was just oozing over the table, bringing extra beers. It was crazy. Pete, oh yeah, that's a constant experience with having dinner with Pete. So if he met a famous actress in real life, I'm sure. Charm would be up to 11. Perhaps we should refer it in that uh, the eyes are consistent with uh, in his mouth residents. All right. You, thanks, Matt, for destroying my reputation as an asshole. But, it's, uh, it's good to wear sunglasses when you go out to lunch or dinner with Pete because the aura of brightness that he's aiming at the waitress is blinding. You know, so if you are nice, but on the other hand, I had my notebook out and I was taking notes. So if you are nice <laughs> and you take care of your waitress, I, and agree. I agree. Compliment her; she will take care of you. And I then, agree. when you go back, you are taken care of again. And always over tip if you can yeah, afford to go out to dinner and you can care. afford to. Yes. Over yes. To, uh, you you went there, didn't you, Kelly? Um, all right, I want to recommend a book. Yeah, Pete? No, just go ahead. All right, I will. Fine, I will. <laughs> Be that. Yeah, you do that. I want to recommend a book called Dead Romance by Lawrence Miles. And right now, everyone listening is going, I don't read romantic books. Uh, Dead Romance the un is an unlikely title. If you... I already sent this recommendation to Rick via email and Corey Herndon because uh, they're both huge Doctor Who fans. However, uh, 
I don't want to give away any spoilers, but it's this is a Lovecraftian book of sorts, cosmic horror. Let's put it that way. And Doctor Who doesn't show up. He's referred to. And how he's referred to is pretty interesting, too. Um, so, you know, look it up on Amazon. I, I think, I, I, yeah, I did link to it in the below the video or below the um, in the synopsis, I should say. Um, it's really, really good. It's a really surprising book. So it, that's really all I'm going to say. I don't want to give away the plot. Is, is this a Faction Paradox book? Yes. It is a Faction it, it, Paradox book. Okay. Zero. Right. Okay. It has a character in it from the description named Bernice Summerfield. And I've seen that name somewhere before. Bernice Summerfield? Yeah. I think she, they may be big Finnish audio dramas about it. Bernice Summerfield was a, if I'm remembering correctly, she was in many of the Virgin... Doctor Who standalone novelizations. Uh, okay. She was sort of like a anthropologist slash archaeologist. And what about Chris Swedge? S W E J. I think it's C W E J. Um, C W E J. You're right. I don't remember his link to the Doctor Who universe. I believe he one. was a companion for a while. I don't know okay. if that was on the TV show or books it or audio. Probably would have been in the new adventures of Doctor Who. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't on the TV show. Right. Okay, I will right. read this from Amazon. Considered the greatest work by novelist Lawrence Miles. Um and it looks like this updated edition includes a couple of other short stories too. But this is a novel. Uh she encounters a time travel traveler named Christopher Swedge. I know I'm saying that wrong. And here, this is not a spoiler, okay? Because it's on the very back of the book. Uh, the world, the end of the world occurred on October the twelfth, nineteen seventy. Now that's what sucked me in when I was in the used bookstore. You like um, time travel books, though. So it's all I'm gonna say is now it's less a it's not really a time travel book. It's a uh, Cosmic horror book. So Pete, you'd probably enjoy it too. I think a lot of people listening to this would enjoy it. So, and especially if you're a, you know, you like cosmic horror Lovecraft, slash Lovecraftian fiction and Doctor Who, you're especially going to enjoy it for those those references because it happens in, you know, in that world. Let's say. So. All right. Uh, what else do we have to talk about? Oh, um, Pete, did you see this a while back when Batman was in the Mobius chair? You remember that about a year ago? Yes, in vehicle, the yes. Yeah, so he's in the Mobius chair and he asks the Mobius chair for the identity of the Joker. Right, and, and he does he, get a name. And he says, that's impossible. He gets, he, what he's told is that there are three Jokers. He doesn't get a name. Okay. And that's what he says that's impossible, too. Uh, here's a title from IGN.com. Jeff Johns and Jason Fabok to explore DC Rebirth's Three Jokers mysteries. Mystery. Uh, Batman is finally getting back to his most important case. It's going to be really interesting to see where they go with this. What, what do you think of this, Pete? Because, you know, you're a real completist with this type of stuff. Um, well, you know, the first thing I would say is that the Mobius chair is is not is is kind of unstuck in time. So there could be three jokers. Um, but they could be jokers from anywhere any time point in the DC universe. Or um, other universes. Or, yeah, there, you know, that's one thing you could play with. Um, I, you know, I've been playing with this idea of succession, and sometimes uh, in superhero storylines, and sometimes there's a, you know, and and Rick knows about this. There's a whole timeline of when Batman changes. Yeah. When yeah. Was that? Can you hear me? When he's rebooted, you mean? 
No, not when he's no the the idea where he's not rebooting. When you know the original Bruce Wayne dies, and then Bruce Wayne Jr. takes over, and then mm. it's Dick Grayson. There, there's an idea that that is what's going on, as opposed yeah. to the reboot, which I never liked. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It'd be easy to do that with the Joker, where he you don't know who he is to begin with. Well, we should bring. A, uh, I don't watch Gotham, but I was reading, seeing excerpts from what they did with the Joker. And uh, we, we've had uh, de facto two Jokers. No, you go ahead. What, what, what happened in the recent episode is uh, the character who you thought was the Joker got killed and he uh, had a gas created by the Scarecrow, which uh, he sent to his twin brother and turned him into the Joker. Sort of laughing gas, which makes your face white or whatever. But before they, when I was watching the show, what they were playing around for a while was a um, concept from German movies for a series called Dr. Malbuza, where anybody could be the Joker. Right, which I think, you know, the yes, the, you know, the, the concept of Dr. Mabuza was passed along. It was an entity, a thing that was moved from one one person to another. Well, uh, it, it, there were two themes in, in the Mabuza films. One was that Mabuza was an evil spirit who possessed different people, but there was also... That was in, like, the second movie, but it was also the concept of the copycat criminal in that you, you don't need the spirit. And they did, uh, if, if uh, you remember uh, Arrow, I'm trying to remember, was it the first, probably I think of the second season, when they had the original version of um, that Vertigo character, I think it's Count Vertigo. Count Vertigo, yeah. They, they did the testament of Dr. Mabuza as the, as the second Count Vertigo story, where he was in an asylum and he thought he was committing all these crimes and it turned out to be a psychiatrist treating him. Right. Which they um, also, by the way, ripped off in Spider Man was the third Green Goblin. So there's a concept of anybody could be developed, right? And, and um, it's an idea it? more than a person. Um, Matt Wagner in his Grendel series does something similar, where the idea of Grendel is is passed along from person to person um, until until the whole concept infects the planet. Um, but yeah, th th those were to be, be some interesting ideas and ways to explore that concept, Mike. Um, yeah. I'd rather see that than, than the easier ways. Well, Kelly sent me a text, looks like a few minutes ago, a screen grab from F. Paul Wilson's Facebook page. He says, okay, taking my time, but I just passed the 25,000 mark on the new Jack novel, referring to, of course, Repairman Jack, a series that I love. Me too. How cool is that? I thought we were done with Repairman Jack. I, thought I, feared, so I feared we were done. Yeah, I thought we had the origin story and the young adult series, so, and the world was effectively ended as we knew it. <laughs> Well, I guess Paul is meant it literally when he told me last when I saw him. He goes, "I can't stop writing about him," and I thought, "Okay, you know." Well, it's, he, he's, I'm not taking this seriously because the the, it, the arc is over, but I guess I should. <laughs> he could he he could still be doing short stories uh, like for the those team up in anthologies and. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know who I got to see last Friday night? That was really fun. The Lovecraftian horror author that we don't think of as a Lovecraftian author from your neck of the woods, Mike. Joe Lansdale. Oh yeah. You know, he's yeah. he's he's made fame right now with the Hap and Leonard series. Which is really good if you're not watching it. But he started out as a you know essentially a pulp writer. And if you go back and you look at his his 
bibliography. I mean, he's written Long Ranger and Jonah Hex, but in Batman. And Batman, but in a lot of these stories, he deals with some Lovecraftian themes. Well, in the Batman short story that he wrote, uh, which I've mentioned before, uh, it's basically a Batman mythos story, pretty much. It's really great. Great mood, great studying too. Yeah, he does. Uh, you know, I did not realize that he's actually won a, won awards for his historical fiction. Hmm. Um, he writes uh, details about East Texas, and he's written some historical mysteries that have really just been highly critically acclaimed. So, but uh, yeah, I got to sit down and talk to him about Lovecraftian fiction and. Um, what he was writing and you know what his inspirations are and he's a really interesting guy and you know he showed me a whole bunch of stuff that I had didn't realize that he had written okay, what do you have know. to say about Lovecraftian fiction can you share any of that well actually so you know he's just he loves some of those concepts and you know they're you know he's used them in the Jonah Hex books and you know Worms, you know, he's he's a big Robert E. Howard guy too, right? Um, and uh, Robert Rick, he wrote a he finished a Burroughs novel for Tarzan. Yes. Um, but you know, he's he's fond of this whole concept of the worms of the earth coming out and and eating people and then retreating back, and so you have this sort of slow unknowing degradation of a community and they don't really understand what's going on. Did he, oh. he did a, uh, it's been a while since I read it. He did a Conan graphic novel. Yep. Which I remember had nameless cults in a, 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 a Hyborian, uh, I mean, a, a, a Hyborian version before Von Jones wrote it in the 19th century. And I think he used the uh, worms of the earth. Yeah, he his, his most Lovecraftian story to me is the crawling sky, which is bloody brilliant. I mean, the first section, you know, it's not exactly a chapter, but the first section is worth the price of whatever book you pick it in. To which is so wonderful. It's funny and. <laughs> That's it's in the book of Cthulhu. Yeah. Okay, but the other thing that he wrote that's more directly Lovecraftian, he wrote the script, I guess, for a comic called The Dunwich Horror from IDW. It was a four part series, and it wasn't, it was really more or less a sequel years later. Um, I guess some young people go to Wilbur Watley's farm and resurrect his twin. And then they have to put it back down. So there's a, you can get it, I think, as a compiled graphic novel now. So if you want his Lovecraftian stuff, I, I would start with The Crawling Sky because it's bloody brilliant. Um, you can also read that comic. I just, I was, I've been reading a, a collection called this, well, not a collection, it's a graphic novel called The Steam Man of the Prairies. And it's basically his version of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, just but much much darker. So hmm. yeah, that's a, that's interesting. Yeah, He's man a, of the prairies. Yeah, using characters, I guess, from Western. Uh... Yeah, but the villain is the time traveler. Okay. Who has jumped back in the middle of the War of the Worlds, and is releasing more locks all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this sounds really interesting actually. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> you know, it's a time travel horror with a lot of um monstrous overtones. Well, which segues into me saying that I was actually going to spend some time on my time travel books, but I'm not because Fracassi has been bragging to me that he's got more time travel books or that at least his his shelf compares to mine. So I'm gonna wait till he's done with this marriage BS or whatever he's doing. I don't know. Uh, I think he's getting married. <laughs> At least that's his excuse for not showing up. Um, 
that's one thing since they bring in the Morlocks. Uh, I always, when I finally read the Time Machine, I found it fascinating that the Morlocks were different from all the movie versions. They're not like survivors of an atomic war. They're uh, the, the working class gone. Uh, they kind of degenerate like uh, the creatures in the lurking fear. Yes, uh, Rick, and that's that. That feeds into one of my concepts where I think that you know Lovecraft may have been rewriting some classic um, horror novels that he was familiar with. Yeah. There are some parallels between, say, Dracula and the case of Charles Dexter Ward, and then the Lurking Fear and the Morlocks. Um. We, this is a whole other show. So, for yeah. whatever reason, I can I can feel my internet starting to go. Um, Me too. So I, I got storm wrap, running. Wrap up before that may uh, have been it. What's that? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, uh, you're you're breaking up pretty badly. Yeah. Badly. Badly. <laughs> Okay, well, why don't break. we just wrap up then? How's that? Okay, um, I have the prize, remember? Well, what's wrap the prize, man? Call of Cthulhu, David Shepard's version. <laughs> Mike, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I don't know okay. what's going on with my internet these days. I'm going to have to try and fix it before next week. So did you give out the prize email address, Matt? Um, it's easy and stuff with prizes and stuff. Yeah, that's great. Uh, <laughs> Lovecraft easy and prizes at gmail.com. Put the title of the book in the, in the uh, subject of the email. It's yeah. a professional show, guys. Very professional. Very, very, very. Keep, remember, this is live. So, can I ask you a quick question, Mike? Yeah. What was that uh, supernatural episode that had Lovecraftian uh, elements in it? I don't remember the title, but it wasn't. It wasn't last Thursday's. It was the Thursday before that. Okay. Right. It, it was the one right after Scooby Natural. Oh, it's right. one right after Scooby Natural. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for listening, and sorry about my internet at the end here. And hopefully, we'll get that fixed before next week. Willem, so great to see you and talk with you again. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody. Great Thank you. Thank you, Willem. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.